I'm a movie theater usher. We have some weird rules. I've been an usher at the movie theater for three years, and it's now clear to me that the rules at the theater where I work are a bit strange. Okay, that's a lie. They're insane. But you can judge for yourself. A little background before I start. My name is Sean. I'm 21 years old, and I've been doing this job for three years. There are two reasons why I'm here and why I don't leave, even when I realize how bad this place is. First, not many people would hire a high school student with a criminal record for petty theft and drug possession. I made some bad decisions early in my life. And although I'm better now, my life has been forever marked by those unfortunate choices. The second reason is the pay. An usher's job is to check tickets, clean rooms between showings, and make sure the movies are running smoothly. Usually, ushers earn minimum wage if they're lucky. On the other hand, I'm paid like a manager of any normal business. Although when you factor in the things I have to deal with daily, it becomes much less attractive. But none of you really care about that, do you? You're here for the story, I know. So here are the rules of the movie theater where I work. Rule number one, never open the door to room three when the movie has started. Sounds simple, right? This rule and the time I almost broke it were the first signs I noticed that this theater was 100% not normal. Even knowing about room three, you'll be drawn to step inside. The room is very clever and it will try to trick you in any way it can. You might hear something from inside, you might be told by someone to open it, but you should never do so. The first time I almost entered room three was a week after I was hired. I had read the rules, for sure, and I was confused by them. But I didn't question them. I needed this job. Badly. If I had to put up with some weird and mysterious rules to get my paycheck, then so be it. I was cleaning the main lobby where the entrances to the individual screening rooms are when I heard it. The sound of something banging on a hard surface. And it was coming from room three. I rushed to the door. Clearly something was wrong inside. A thin smoke was rising from underneath it. By now, the banging was louder as if someone was using their fists to pound on the door from the inside. The doorknob was turning, rattling in its socket. The person on the other side was desperately trying to get out. Hello! I yelled, pressing my hands against the flat surface of the door. Let us out! Help us! A voice from the other side. It was a woman's voice, terror audible in every word. Underneath, I could hear a faint roaring like strong wind in a tunnel. It took me a second to realize what it was. Flames. There was a fire. The door was stuck. You have to let us out. The woman screamed desperately. Smoke was billowing out from under the black door. I coughed violently. The pounding on the other side resumed. Let us out. Please let us out. I reached for the doorknob. All thoughts of rules had vanished from my mind. There were people in there who needed my help. A hand reached out from behind and grabbed my arm. I jumped and spun around. It was David, my manager. I had only spoken to him at my interview for this position. He gave me the impression of a calm but distant man. Now he was furious. Anger etched into every line of his face. Rule one, never forget it. There's a fire inside, David. The door is stuck. We need to let them out. A fire. Oh, it's clever today. David laughed to himself, trying the new guy too. Then he became serious again. There's a reason we have rules. Leave room three alone, everything in there is fine. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. The woman from inside called out again. She was now choking as the smoke seared her lungs. Please help me, Sean. I can't breathe, let us out. David laughed again. You can hear her, David, they're going to die. I shouted, incredulous at how heartless he could be. I'm not going to let people die because of you and your crazy stupid rules. I reached for the doorknob. David looked me dead in the eye. How does she know your name? I stopped. Had I told her my name? No. I looked at the door again. No smoke, no pounding fists. I cautiously knocked on it a few times. No one answered. David placed a hand on my shoulder. You see, Sean, he said patiently. Room three is still closed. There's nothing wrong. In 20 minutes, the movie will end and everyone will come out safe and sound. I promise. But, but I heard her voice. I saw the smoke, I stammered. Confusion overwhelmed me. You saw what it wanted you to see. Trust me, Sean. Room three will try everything to get you to open that door. But it hasn't succeeded in 13 years, and it certainly won't succeed while I'm the manager here. 
I won't let it happen again. He gently led me away from the door. Twenty minutes later, when the movie in room three ended, a crowd walked out. Everyone was unharmed. I checked the room afterward. There were no signs of fire anywhere. Rule number two. If you see a man dressed as a movie character leading children out of the theater, notify the manager immediately. You know how many theaters hire people in costumes or suits to advertise new movies, right? Like when a new Star Wars movie comes out and you have people in stormtrooper outfits walking around the building to advertise to people. I hated those things, even before I started working here. One of the odd jobs I did after dropping out of school was at a loud, bustling amusement park outside of town. I had to wear a smelly, unwashed costume of the park's mascot for eight hours straight, six days a week. Now just looking at one of those things makes me nauseous. Rule two is a bit mysterious. I've only followed it once, and I'm not even sure what really happened. But it's an interesting story, though creepy. You might like it. The day it happened was our Avengers Infinity War premiere. The manager had hired some cosplayers, dressed as the main characters, to walk around the lobby and take photos with fans. I was generally okay with that, despite my past experiences. What worried me was that before the shift started, David gathered all the ushers and made us memorize the list of superheroes he had hired. He was absolutely insistent about it, emphasizing that we needed to know them well. If it wasn't for the incident with Room 3, I would have thought he was crazy. But now I knew that things happening here weren't as they seemed. It wasn't a long list, so I can still remember it. Captain America, Black Panther, Doctor Strange, Thor, in hindsight, the poor guy dressed as the Thunder God must have been sad about how fat his favorite character had become in Endgame. I knew something was about to happen when I came out of one of the screening rooms and saw a person dressed as Iron Man. A single Iron Man, slowly walking down the hallway towards the trash room. Getting closer, I could see something was wrong with him. His suit had once been high quality, but now seemed to be damaged. It was dirty and crumpled some parts on the verge of falling off completely. He smelled terrible, like the stench of decay on a hot summer day. But the worst thing was, there was some kind of liquid oozing from the joints of his costume. It was a sickly brown-black color, viscous, almost like dried molasses. My heart nearly stopped when I saw behind him was a group of children. None of them looked older than ten. They stared straight ahead, following that putrid figure as he led them away from the crowd in an amnesiac line. My challenge with room three had taught me all I needed to know about the rules. I ran quickly to the manager's office, burst inside and shouted into David's room. Rule two, Iron Man costume, heading to the trash room. There are three kids with him. There was a crash from the office as David jumped off his chair too quickly, causing it to fall to the ground. Damn it, damn it, damn it. I should have known. I shouldn't have hired anyone. I shouldn't have hired anyone. God, I should have known. He rummaged through his desk drawer. I caught a glimpse of him taking something out before he hid it in his pocket. A vial containing some clear liquid and a long, wicked-looking knife made of copper. As he rushed out of the office, he stopped and grabbed me, shoving a crumpled piece of paper into my hand. Make sure no one goes into the trash room. Don't let anyone in, do you understand? If I'm not out in half an hour, Hit the fire alarm and evacuate the building. Then, call the number on this paper. There was no time for questions. David rushed out of the room and I ran after him. As we rounded a corner, I saw that Iron Man had nearly led the children into the trash room. He was three meters from the door, the children still blindly following. David rushed past them and yanked open the door. Then, in one smooth motion, he grabbed the costumed figure threw him inside and slammed the door shut. The children jerked, like puppets having their strings pulled up and down. Then they looked around, confused. They might not have even known how they got there. So, they did what any children would do in that situation. They started crying. It was 23 minutes before David left the trash room. There were dark red stains on his clean shirt and a horrific stench lingered about him. He looked exhausted. Clean up in there, Sean. If you see anything strange outside the trash bags, don't touch it. Come tell me. He staggered back to his office. The trash room was a wreck. Black, 
foul-smelling liquid staining the floor, walls, even the ceiling in some places. In the corner were a few black plastic bags. A damp patch of that black liquid was slowly spreading underneath them. Rule number three. If a man with a tattoo on his left cheek wants something from the lost and found, don't give it to him. This story isn't exactly tied to a personal experience I've had, but I still have something to say about it. After the Rule 2 incident, David started treating me better. I guess he trusted me a bit more. Because he knew I had learned my lesson and understood that the rules weren't there for nothing. They were there to protect all of us. I was curious about Rule 3. After a while, I mustered up the courage to ask about it. So, before a shift one day, I stepped into the office and cautiously asked about it. David, um, sorry to bother you, but uh, I was wondering if... Could you tell me more about Rule 3? David chuckled dryly. Curious, aren't you? Don't worry, I was too. He started rummaging through his drawers and files. Finally, he handed me some yellowed papers stapled together at the corner. Here, read this during your break. Hopefully, it'll satisfy your curiosity. When my break time came, I sat down in our locker room and did just that. The papers were actually a series of news articles stapled together. The first one was from 15 years ago. Killer brutally murders three. A family was slaughtered in their own home. The sole survivor tells a horrifying tale. Neighborhoods were shocked yesterday after police discovered a gruesome murder scene in the home of local residents, the Prescotts. Of the family of four, only one survived, Tommy Prescott, 13, who was found bound and gagged, but unharmed, in his family's living room next to the mutilated bodies of his parents and sister. Found at the crime scene was an umbrella that the survivor said his mother had forgotten after the family's trip to the local movie theater earlier that week. The theater manager, David, told our reporters that the umbrella had been picked up by a tattooed man who claimed it was his a day before the murders took place. Police are investigating the possibility that this man is connected to the incident, but so far their search has been unsuccessful. The next two articles, from 12 and 5 years ago respectively, and published by different newspapers, tell the same story. A mass murder, one mentioning an item lost from our lost and found box found at the crime scene. The other doesn't, but David had written below it in pencil, same person. What does the tattoo mean? Need to make a rule about him. However, the final article was what really shocked me. It wasn't modern. In fact, it was just a printed photo of an ancient page. The year printed at the top indicated it was from London, 1899. The writing was hard to read, but the headline told me all I needed to know. Stage fright, London theater closes amidst rampant killings as mysterious murderer demands forgotten items. Rule number four. If the lights go out while you're cleaning a room, sit down. A movie will play. You must watch it until the end. Don't look away from the screen, no matter what you see or hear. This is the rule that worried me most when I read it. After experiencing rules one and two, I knew how serious following these rules or failing to do so could be. My experience with rule number four happened when I was cleaning room one after a movie. Without warning, it happened, what I had dreaded for months at that point. The lights went out, no sound, just like a bulb burning out. One second, I was in a fully lit room. The next, I was standing in pitch darkness. I froze, although I had mentally prepared for this for weeks, I was still stunned. Sit down, damn it, sit down. Finally, my limbs obeyed reason. I jumped to where I hoped was the nearest row of seats and threw myself into a seat, just in time. The screen lit up, all static at first, before switching to an image of a dark basement. The image quality was very old, like some Super 8mm film from the 90s. Through the grainy screen, I could make out that there was a single chair in the middle of the room. Tied to it was a young man. He was struggling against his bonds, and I could see he was injured. Small streams of blood ran down his face from a wound on his forehead, and his arms were chafed from the ropes. There was something very familiar about the captive. Not his face, I'd never seen it before. But his clothes, I shivered as I heard something move behind me. It was the creak of a movie theater seat. The hair on the back of my neck stood up. Someone, something, had just sat down behind me. It took all of my willpower not to spin around or jump out of my seat and rush to the door. I kept my eyes glued to the screen, praying this would be over soon. 
The man on the screen was stopping his struggle. He was looking at something behind the camera. It took me a second to realize he must be looking at the cameraman. I nearly jumped out of my seat. When a voice whispered behind me, Good actor, isn't he? The voice was low, a whisper that was almost inaudible. It sounded human-like, almost, but I knew it wasn't human. I can't explain exactly how. It was something about the rhythm of its speech, as if its throat wasn't made for human language, and it was just mimicking as best it could what it had heard. Even worse, the voice came from slightly above me, not directly behind. Whatever was in the seat behind me, it must have been unnaturally tall when standing. Should I answer? Should I keep watching the screen? The rules hadn't told me about this. I stayed silent, clenching my fists to keep from shaking, eyes forward on the screen. The camera was moving as the cameraman brought it closer to his prisoner. The man in the chair tried to jerk away desperately, but his bonds were too tight to do anything but the smallest movements. And as the camera got closer, I realized what was familiar about him. His clothes, he was wearing a movie theater uniform my movie theater uniform. Where do you think they got the costume? The thing sitting behind me whispered, cruel irony in every word. It was toying with me. I didn't answer. The film went on for about half an hour. I won't tell you exactly what I saw. I don't want to think about it any more than I have to. I'm not sure that content would be allowed on this website, even in description. Suffice to say, I wouldn't want such a terrible fate. At one point, I dry heaved and vomited all over myself and the floor. While my stomach was convulsing, I almost took my eyes off the screen, and right then I felt the hot, foul breath of that thing on the back of my neck. It wanted me to look away. It wanted me to give up. I looked up, fixing my eyes back on the horrible scene playing on the screen. The thing behind me only spoke once more, before the lights came on as suddenly as they had gone out. It sounded annoyed, even angry. You know what they say, Sean? Rules are made to be broken, or at least that guy thought so. I wish I could end the story there, but unfortunately there's a bit more. Because the guy on the screen used to work here, because he died breaking a rule. Because David hadn't told us everything. Instead, keeping us on a need-to-know basis. Just need to know. So someone had suffered a fate worse than death because of his secrecy. And I was going to make him explain himself. Still covered in vomit and cold sweat, I burst into the hallway, ignoring the disgusted looks from the customers there. I barged into the office. David calmly looked up. Rule four or 11? Rule number four. Good, good, good. Do you know what the risks are? You know what could happen, but you didn't tell anyone. The guy I saw, the things it did to him, you could have prevented that. David sighed warily. This is better, Sean. What, how could it be? Let me explain it to you, David said, standing up and looking me straight in the eye. His voice now had a hint of steel, and his eyes flashed with a suppressed anger. I fell silent. Some things can be avoided if you know about them. Room 3 is like that. If you know what it wants, and how it will try to get it, it's easier not to fall for it. But there are some things, Sean, some things that only become stronger when you know more about them. You can avoid breaking rule number four with what you know right now. You just need to keep looking at the screen that, but the more you know about it, the clearer things in that room become, trying to make you look away. And that last guy, the one I saw on the screen, he knew too much, even more than you do now. That's a mistake I'll never make again, and a lesson I'll never forget. There's a line, Sean, I can't allow anyone to cross. If you know too much, no will or strength can make you keep your eyes on that screen. Rule number five. If you encounter a room where all the customers are staring straight at you and smiling, notify the manager immediately. Rule number five is the rule that raised the most questions in my mind about this theater and my job. My encounter with it happened when I had been working here for about a year and a half. One thing you should know about an usher's job we need to check if all the movies are running smoothly, if the subtitles are working, etc. We're only obligated to do so at the beginning of each showing, but if we have some free time during our shift, we like to do random checks to make sure everything is okay. Unfortunately, it was because of this that one day, I walked into room 5, nearly having a heart attack when I realized that everyone inside was looking me in the eye, smiling strangely. 
Careful not to blink, I slowly backed out of the room. The patrons never took their eyes off me, not even blinking. The moment I was relatively safe in the hallway, I ran to David, who was talking to a customer at our small bar. Rule number five, I said when I reached him. David turned pale. The customer and attractive young woman looked at him with confusion. I'm sorry, David mumbled to her before turning to me. Which room? Number five, I replied. Follow me. We ran to the room and once inside David signaled for me to stay at the end of the row of seats. Stay here. He didn't need to tell me twice. The room was full of deadly silent patrons. Every head silently turned to follow David as he walked to the front of the screen and stopped in the middle of the room. What do you want? He said to the large room. Everyone in the room simultaneously opened their mouths and spoke in a perfect chorus. Hello manager, it's been a while. Cut the nonsense, David interrupted. I know your game. What do you want this time? The room laughed coldly in unison. Always so direct, I've always liked you more than your predecessor. David clenched his jaw, his hands had curled into fists. I had never seen him so angry. Tell me what you want. He gritted through his teeth. Tell me what you want and then let these people go. Ah, so impatient, eager for it to be over? The crowd replied, I want you to open room three. Right now, David turned pale. No, ask for something else. There are lines I won't cross, there are rules. The thing behind the crowd's eyes laughed loudly. Ah yes, your precious rules. You think they can prevent anything? They prevent nothing, David, they only delay it. Giving me free information. David said sarcastically, You've changed since the last time we talked. I'm only telling you what you already know, and my price hasn't changed. You will open room three again. For the first time, David hesitated, just for a second, but the thing noticed and laughed at him cruelly. I told you, I won't do that. That rule is never broken, he said finally. You've forgotten your history after just 13 years. The crowd mocked. The fate of these people is in your hands. David, you know what will happen to them if my price isn't paid, don't you? Are you trying to blame this meaningless resistance for your mistake? I'm not blaming, David growled, and I'm not making a mistake. Would the one you miss so dearly agree? I don't think so. The thing said, there was a silence. Then the crowd spoke again. The price has been paid. These people are safe. David blinked in confusion. What? What price? Room three was never the price. The pain of your memories, as well as the unanswered questions that will now cost this servant of yours, that was the price. You bastard, David whispered. You bastard. Until next time, manager. David stormed out of the room without another word. The crowd followed him with their eyes and then fixed on me, a smile, a nod. Then the crowd looked up as one and shed their identical behavior. An underlying tension was released. They were free. Rule number six. If customers hear noises in the ventilation ducts, assure them that you'll look into it. Take one of the packages marked R6 from behind the bar, go into the ventilation duct through the trash room, and place the package inside at least 10 meters from the entrance. Get out of the duct as quickly as possible. This is one of the easiest rules to follow. Although the time limit was initially quite worrying, this is also one of the most common occurrences usually happening about once a week. Fortunately, I've never seen anyone fail to do it. The first time I had to feed the thing in the duct was during a very busy shift. We had premiered The Rise of Skywalker a few days earlier, and we were still crowded with customers. I was cleaning the hallway of spilled popcorn from earlier when an angry-looking young man in a Star Wars t-shirt came up to me. Good day, sir. Can I? I began. Yeah, buddy, whatever. He cut me off immediately. Can you fix your damn air conditioning? There's something banging around in there near the vent in our room. I'm not paying for this crap. I gritted my teeth to suppress my irritation at the man's behavior, but kept my cool. Yes, sir, of course. I apologize for the inconvenience. David might forgive you for letting a room full of people die at the hands of God knows what, but he won't allow you to be rude to customers. That's just how he is. After the customer left, I took one of the marked packages from behind the bar. It was oddly heavy, and I could feel moisture seeping out from inside. Trying my best to ignore it, I crossed the trash room and opened the air duct grate. I could hear what the customer had complained about. 
a rapid tapping sound, like relentless fingers drumming on the duct walls. My skin crawled, uncomfortable being so close to the sound of dozens of long, crooked legs. I took a deep breath and crawled into the duct. The air inside was cold and gloomy, the passage narrow, forcing me to lie flat, pushing myself forward with arms and knees. As I crawled forward, I could see by the dim light that there was a pile of something ahead, around the 10-meter mark. When I reached it, I shuddered. In the duct before me was a pile of gnawed animal bones. With trembling fingers, I opened the package and dropped an entire chicken onto the pile of remains. The sound in the duct stopped. I held my breath. Then it returned, faster, louder than before, a frenzied staccato rhythm, hungry. Terror and adrenaline flooding my brain, I shot back down the passage. How long had I been in there? How long had I been gone? 30 seconds? 20? The tapping of feet now mixed with a scraping sound as something heavy dragged itself towards the food and towards me. And finally, my feet hit the end of the duct. Kicking frantically, I fell onto the trash room floor, slamming the air duct grate shut. The tapping inside had stopped. Listening closely, I could hear the sound of tearing flesh. And this was one of the easier rules. Rule number seven, if you notice shadows out of sync with their surroundings, return alone to the last room you entered as quickly as possible. Close the door, then return to normal. Until you do so, do not touch your shadow under any circumstances. The greatest danger you can face in this job is becoming too familiar with the strangeness. That was the mistake I made with rule number seven. I had grown complacent. I wasn't paying attention anymore. I had made it to the other side of the hallway from room six before I realized I didn't have a shadow. Cold sweat covered my forehead. I looked back at the path I had taken. My shadow was completely detached from me, lying on the floor next to room six's door. And another usher, a man named Liam, stood between me and it. He was staring straight into my eyes with a grin on his face. I had to think quickly. Whatever was happening, I had to get back to room six. But with Liam blocking the way, I had no path to get there, not without confronting him. Sean, is everything all right? David called from his office doorway. He sounded concerned, even worried. Could I answer him? Would that make things worse? I ignored the question and started making my way back to room six. The more I looked around, the more apparent it became how strange my surroundings were. Each shadow fell in a different direction, as if each object was lit by a different light source. Now I was close to Liam. I slowed down, walking in a way that I hoped would appear casual if I could just get past him and to the door. David asked you a question, Sean, Liam said. The thin smile still plastered on his face. He stepped in front of me, blocking my path. I heard him, Liam. I just forgot something in room six, that's all. And what's that, Sean? What did you forget? He knew I could see it in his eyes. Liam, or whatever was pretending to be Liam, knew what I was trying to do. It knew I hadn't been fooled by its act. I heard the office door open behind me, footsteps approaching. Sean, David asked, what did you forget? He walked around me, standing next to Liam. I had to convince them that I didn't realize anything was wrong. I couldn't get to room six if I didn't. Even if I got there, the rules said I had to be alone. They couldn't follow me. I forgot to clean up a spilled drink. I was just going to grab some napkins from the trash room and take care of it. I smiled weakly, cursing my shaking voice. It was a terrible lie. I could see it in David's eyes. He wasn't convinced. Liam, help him out, will you? He said, heading back to his office. Liam grinned at me again. It was a terrible sight. Let's go then, Sean, he mocked. We walked to the trash room. My mind was racing as I desperately tried to think of a way out of this situation. Liam was watching me from the corner of his eye, waiting for me to make a run for room six. A desperate plan formed in my head. It was a gamble, and I knew the theater's other rules might not even apply in wherever this was. But it was the only escape I could think of. We entered the trash room. Liam wasn't even pretending anymore. He was staring straight at me, still wearing that horrible grin. With Liam following, I walked to the back of the trash room and punched him in the face with all my strength. The thing wearing his body stumbled backward, surprised. And in that moment, I fumbled for the air duct in the back of the room, opening it at the last second. 
Its fingers grabbed me from behind and spun me around to face it. The human facade Liam had been wearing earlier was peeling off like a snake's skin. His face became asymmetrical. His eyes had darkness in them. He laughed in my face. I knew you weren't fooled. I knew it. The game is over now. It's time for you to meet your shadow. It ranted. I hope you like it here because you'll be staying with me. I desperately kicked out, fighting against its strength as it tightened its grip on my arms. I managed to spin us around, pushing back towards the open air duct. It cried out in pain. Since your manager made his stupid rules, I've been alone, no more, first you, then him. Finally, I heard what I had desperately hoped for, a sound from the air duct behind Liam, skittering feet. The thing only had a second to realize what I had done. Its eyes widened. No, then it was yanked backward. An immense force pulled it into the vent. Bones cracked as its back and legs bent at bizarre angles. Then it was gone, screaming and cursing. I staggered away from the wall. I had very little time. As I rushed across the hallway towards room six, the thing wearing David's face burst out of the office. It shouted in frustration as it lunged at me. I made it to room six. My shadow curled on the ground, trying to reach me, but just missed. David was close, mere meters away. An angry and desperate cry filled the air. I flung the door open, jumped inside, and slammed it shut behind me. Silence. Cautiously, I opened the door again. The lobby was empty. I looked down and sighed in relief. My shadow was once again at my feet. Rule number eight. If a trash bag starts moving violently or making noise, dispose of it in the special chute in the trash room without opening it. One of our jobs here is to clean out the trash room after each shift. This means loading all the garbage onto a cart and taking it to the basement parking lot where trucks come to collect it weekly. Rule eight is probably the worst after number four. It's not mentally scarring, but it can still give you a headache if you think about it too much. It certainly caused me quite a bit of distress when I had to deal with it for the first time, about a year ago. I was almost done with the day's trash. One more trip with the cart and I'd be finished. I was looking forward to ending my shift and getting back to my warm bed at home. That's when one of the trash bags inflated, fell to the floor with a wet thud and started screaming. Help me, oh God, please help me. I screamed and jumped back. The bag writhed on the floor as whoever was inside strained against the thick plastic. It cried out again in panic. Oh God, please, let me out, I can't breathe. My heart was pounding. With shaking fingers, I reached for the bag to tear it open and free the trapped person inside. I gripped the bag and froze. Rule number eight, the thing in the bag wailed in pain and fear. Is anyone there? Please, you have to help me. It started sobbing. The bag shuddered and curled in on itself. A chill ran down my spine. This thing sounded human. It sounded like it was in agony. It sounded real. But this place had taught me not to trust anything I heard or saw. Cautiously, I picked up the bag. A hand shot out of the bag, writhing and grasping at my arm. I yelled and stumbled back, breaking its grip. Help me, you have to help me. I can't move, I can't breathe, I can't. Just the arm was enough, I could still feel its grip on my arm. The arm was human-sized. But no one could fit in that bag. I grabbed the writhing, shapeless mass. Hands grasped at me through the plastic as it begged for help. Staggering under its weight, I lurched towards the trash chute and dropped it down the hole. It clung to the edge with its hands. Please, please. It whispered, almost a hiss. I can't. I can't go back there. Please. Don't. I pried its fingers off the chute lid. It screamed as it slid down the chute, scratching at the sides as it disappeared into darkness and silence. Rule number nine. If someone leaves room three during a showing, do whatever they ask. Inform the manager immediately. For all the wrong reasons, this story isn't like the others I've told. This one's different, and I'm not sure I like it. I'm not sure where it's going to lead me in this theater, because this story happened yesterday. Although David has been warm to me during my time working here, I think he might even trust me. He still hasn't said anything about room three. To be fair, I've been too scared to ask about it. So rule number nine has always been a source of mystery and no small amount of apprehension. No one I've asked can even remember a time when they've had to follow that rule. Although it seems strange, no one has ever left room three during a showing, at least not in the years I've worked here.
No one can remember David ever explaining the rule or even talking about it. Rule number nine is as much a mystery as the room it pertains to. So nothing could have prepared me for yesterday when the door opened and a well-dressed man stepped out of room three. I froze in my tracks, nothing in this job having prepared me for that. He walked over to where I stood, staring in stunned silence and fear. Good evening, sir, he said. His voice was flat, emotionless, like an empty stone slab. But unlike the thing from rule number four, it was unmistakably human. Um, hello, good evening. I finally stammered out. The man smiled pleasantly. I'd like to speak with the manager. Yes, um, right this way, sir. I replied, trying to fake a calm I didn't feel. I wished I could have told it to stay, that I could have warned David, but my brain was frozen, slow and unresponsive. We walked to the office and entered. I didn't even have time to speak. David looked up, saw the man and went pale. Rule number nine, Sean? Yes, please leave us. Wait for me outside. I obeyed. Nothing could have made me stay in that room. Absolutely nothing. I went out into the hallway and waited. Time crawled by. I could hear muffled talking from inside the office. Occasionally, David's voice would rise, and I swear there were times I heard him crying. It was half an hour before David opened the door and stepped out. He was even paler than before, like all the blood had left his body. His hands shook slightly, but I noticed, in the moment before he closed the door, I could see the room behind him. It was empty then. The man had vanished. David? I asked cautiously, not knowing what to say. Is, is everything, what happened? David stared at me, his eyes were bloodshot. Go home, Sean, rest, sleep and prepare. Why? Prepare for what? We're breaking rules number 10 and 11 tomorrow. Walking to work yesterday was the hardest thing I've ever done. Speculation and fear mixed within me. David's advice to rest and sleep I had been unable to follow, and I had spent the night dreading what was to come in the morning. When I arrived at work, I found the theater deserted. There was a sign at the entrance announcing temporary closure due to equipment malfunction. David was there. He sat in his dimly lit office, staring at the wall in silence. I stepped in and stood at the door. I didn't have the courage to interrupt his thoughts. Finally, he looked up. Sean, he said, his voice hoarse. I'm sorry, my mind was drifting. He stood up and walked over to me. He said, today we're breaking the rules. I said yes, rules number 10 and 11. Rule number 10. If you find a black wrapped book on the premises, don't open it. Rule number 10. The black book, we usually call it that. You'll see it on most shifts, and resisting the temptation to open it is one of the first things you have to learn to do this job. No one knows if there are old yellowed pages inside. It moves and shifts mysteriously. You'll see it in the corner of the trash room, propped up invitingly. You'll go to a room or to the office only to see it first on the floor in the hallway and then in the office itself, lying on David's desk as if it had always been there. We've never seen David open it. It seems I'm about to see that now. It took us an unusually long time to find the book. First, we searched the office, lobby and rooms. Then we came back empty handed, only to find it sitting on one of David's filing cabinets. He snorted in derision and went to pick it up. It was ancient pages, yellowed with time, creaking as he carefully opened it. From where I was standing, I couldn't see the writing inside and moved to look over his shoulder. David closed it. Not yet, Sean. Soon enough. I exploded. David, I don't know anything about what's going on. I don't know why we're here today, or why we're breaking two of our rules. I don't expect you to tell me everything, but you have to give me something. My anger subsided as quickly as it had risen. I realized this was, after all, still my manager. David chuckled dryly, a moment of silence. You're right, Sean. You deserve to know something. I'm sorry. After 15 years doing this job, I've gotten used to not telling anyone more than they need to know. 13 years ago, I made a mistake, Sean. Room 3 tricked me by using my feelings for someone close to me. I opened the room and nearly brought disaster upon us all. It's ironic, only the sacrifice of the person I thought I was saving would help delay the catastrophe. Delay? Yes, Sean. We've been borrowing time. Yesterday, that time ran out. Unless we act. Otherwise, Room 3 won't even need anyone to open it anymore. It will escape on its own. And I can't allow that. And the book, what is it? 
I guess you could call it a manual of sorts. The rules of this theater are all in here. He looked down at the pages again. I could tell that this impromptu information session was over. I could be content even with the little information I had gotten. David flipped through some pages, scanning their contents before pointing to a section of the page and smiling to himself. Sean, I'm going to have to ask you to leave the room for a moment. Just for a moment, this won't take long. I hesitated but complied. Standing outside the room, I could see David's shadow on the drawn curtains of his office window as he moved around. Suddenly another dark shadow sprang up behind him. It circled around until it stood facing David. Another shadow joined it, and then another. I was speechless. David seemed resolute. Voices responded, many speaking at once, sharp but just loud enough to hear whispers like knife stabs through skin. The shadows gathered around David. He stood motionless, his arms hanging at his sides. The shadows flickered out, merging with David's shadow, and disappeared. Without waiting for instructions, I ran into the office. I burst through the door. David stood at his desk, warily leaning against it and panting. But he was unharmed. What the hell just happened? I asked. What were those things? David chuckled to himself. I guess you could call them messengers or designators. Can you please stop speaking in riddles for once, David? I was frustrated at still being kept on a need-to-know basis. I called upon something that shouldn't be called, Sean. But this is a day for effort, and desperate times call for desperate measures. Come on, it will be here soon, and I don't want to keep it waiting. He walked past me, still holding the black book. After a moment, I followed in silent frustration. Opening the office door, I found him saying something about the next rule. Rule number 11. If a woman in a black dress offers you a drink, don't accept it. A woman stood before us. She was tall, taller than both of us, and her pale face contrasted with her deep black hair. She wore a sheer black dress. In her hand was a carved wooden cup. I had seen the woman in black before. She, or it, frequently wandered around the theater, occasionally stopping to offer them a drink from her cup. The liquid inside was clear and looked like water. Somehow, I always suspected it was something harmful. Fortunately, she never forced us to drink it. That would make her one of the most dangerous things you could encounter here. When you refuse, she silently nods, understanding, and continues on her way. Now that she's here, will you accept my cup? She said, almost whispering. Her voice was weak and inexplicably sad. I had refused. It was almost muscle memory at that point, honed by dozens of encounters with her. But my words got stuck in my throat as I realized she wasn't looking at me. She was talking to David. He was silent for a moment. I will accept, he finally answered. David, you're... I started confused and frightened. He cut me off. This has to be done. There's no other way we can stop what's coming. He turned back to the woman in black. It's been too long. She smiled faintly and handed him the cup. Drink. David took the cup. He hesitated for a moment. His face suddenly hardened. He drained the cup in one gulp. Then he gasped, staggered, and dropped it to the ground with a thud. He leaned on me heavily and I nearly fell under his sudden weight. His face was sickly pale. He coughed and red streaks fell to the floor. You have paid, the woman whispered. I have paid, David replied, shaking with increasingly bloody coughs. Now for your end of the bargain. Indeed, what do you seek? She smiled sadly. I seek. I seek a way to prevent room three from escaping. David had chosen his words carefully. I realized he only had one shot at this. The woman frowned. You won't like the answer, she whispered. Are you sure this is what you want to know? I asked. I'm sure. David whispered through gritted teeth. Damn it. A thin red streak ran down from the corner of his mouth. Tell me. The woman leaned forward close to David. She whispered to him words I hoped I'd never have to hear. Then she straightened up. The bargain was complete. Farewell, David. She turned and walked away from us as if nothing had happened. She disappeared around the corner. Somehow I knew she wouldn't be there if I went looking. David turned to me. Blood was now flowing from the corners of his eyes too. The black book fell from his fingers. David, what have you done? What's going on? I stammered. What did she say to you? I had to lean forward to hear his answer, his voice weakening with each word. Go. Go to the projection room. Sean, turn on all the projectors. Do it now. Hurry. The command in his tone was absolute. I ran to the projection room. 
I quickly flipped every switch, moving from one projector to the next. The whirring of machinery filled the air. Though it was empty, there was now a showing in every theater of the cinema. I realized what David was doing. I realized it was too late. I raced back to the lobby, taking the stairs three at a time. I had to make it in time. I had to. He was no longer in front of the office. The black book lay open on the floor, the only sign he had ever stood there. I ran to it and looked around the foyer. Of course, David was standing in front of Theater 3. His hand was on the door handle. He looked back at me. There was a glint of blood in his eyes. David, don't, I shouted. Thirteen years, Sean. Use them well, he told me. He smiled. Then he opened the door. Darkness was on the other side. All light stopped right at the doorframe. David didn't hesitate. He stepped through and closed the door behind him. I stood there frozen. He was gone. There was a boom and the ground shook. The door to Theater 3 rattled as if whatever was inside was trying to escape, but it struggled in vain. Whatever David had done, whatever his sacrifice had accomplished, it had imprisoned Theater 3, bound it, bought more time. The rumbling subsided. The door stopped shaking. There was silence. The pages below caught my eye. I looked down at the book at my feet. It was open to the last page. On it was a single sentence, written in black ink. Rule 12, there must always be a manager. 